Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order this public hearing on the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. Time is now 1017 a.m. on Wednesday, October 11th, 2023. We are convening this hearing in person at the John A. Wilson Building in room 500. We are also streaming live on the Office of Cable Television website, Council Channel 13, the DC Council website, and YouTube at at CM Brooke Pinto. I am Council Member Brooke Pinto, representing Ward 2 and Chairwoman of the Committee. We have one bill on the agenda today, Bill 25-318, the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023. This bill was introduced by me, along with Council Member Gray and Chairman Mendelson on June 8th, 2023. Five years ago, the council voted to decriminalize fare evasion in the district. When they did so, WMATA beseeched the council to retain some enforcement mechanism to go along with the civil fine that was proposed as a replacement for the criminal penalty for fare evasion. The council declined to do so. Since then, there has been a substantial increase in fare evasion. Although WMATA has struggled to find a means to effectively track fare evasion in the metro system, on buses, where drivers can easily, more easily track it, the rate of fare evasion grew from 9% in 2018 to 34% in 2022. That in and of itself has frustrated many Metro riders. Riders who follow the rules and pay their fares have trouble understanding why they should pay when others are getting the same service for free. They also feel a sense of disorder in Metro stations when they see riders jumping turnstiles constantly. But besides the issue of fare evasion itself, WMATA has repeatedly expressed concerns that their inability to enforce and deter fare evasion has been associated with an increase in crime, particularly violent crime, in the metro system. The data seem to bear this out. In 2022, there were 195 aggravated assaults committed on the metro system, up from 105 in 2018. This year, as of August, there were already 180 aggravated assaults compared to 130 at the same time last year. As WMATA General Manager Randy Clark has said repeatedly, not everyone who fare evades commits crime on the metro system, but almost everyone who commits a crime on the metro system has fare evaded. WMATA's own statistics bear this out. According to the agency, almost 97% of the offenders who commit violent felonies in the metro system also committed fare evasion. WMATA has already begun taking steps to reduce fare evasion and deter individuals who might be entering the system for purposes other than commuting. Recently, the agency has begun installing taller fare gates at several stations, including at Fort Totten, Pentagon City, Bethesda, Vienna, Mount Vernon Square, and Addison Road. As of August, these new fare gates reduced fare evasion by over 70% at the stations where they were installed. WMATA has also increased law enforcement presence at a number of stations, and this has also been associated with decreases in crime rates. The Metro Safety Amendment Act seeks to give WMATA one more tool to address fare evasion and deter individuals seeking to commit crimes against Metro passengers from entering the system. The bill would require individuals who are stopped for fare evasion to provide their true name and address to the officer who stops them. This would ensure that officers can actually enforce the current civil fine. This remains as a civil fine for fare evasion. Importantly, individuals who refuse to provide their true name and address could be detained and subject to a fine up to $100. Now, it's important to acknowledge how we got here and where we are as we pursue the careful balancing that this bill attempts to uh, get right. The council had justifiable reasons for wanting to decriminalize fare evasion, given the racial inequity and how fare evasion is and has been enforced. And recognizing those issues, the bill allows for only a very limited expansion of fare evasion enforcement. It does not allow for any jail sentence to be imposed for fare evading. Similarly, appreciating the economic inequality that also plays into fare evasion, the bill does not require an individual to present any physical identification to the officer like a driver's license. They only need to provide their true name and address for the purposes of paying the civil fine. Of course, I know that some will say that any effort to expand fare evasion enforcement will lead to racial injustice. But it's important to keep in mind here that when we're talking about racial and socioeconomic justice, 
these issues are complicated and multifaceted. To wit, having a safe and robust public transit system is a hugely important way to support low-income residents in the district who are also disproportionately residents of color and in underserved neighborhoods. As I noted, fare evasion is associated with increased violent crime on Metro, and increased violent crime makes people feel less safe and less willing to use the Metro for those who have other choices. Not everybody has other choices. We've seen this happening with residents saying that they're scared to take the Metro and scared to have their kids take Metro to school while they're unattended. Moreover, as WMATA faces an imminent fiscal cliff, the financial impacts of fare evasion could lead the agency to cut service. Service cuts would undoubtedly have the greatest impact on low income residents in the district. The fare evasion problem could erode residents' support for increased funding for the agency. And we know from WMATA's Rider Advisory Council that riders are frustrated by the lack of enforcement of fare evasion. I want to note that I do think it's very important that we take steps to mitigate potential harms of fare evasion enforcement. We need to enhance support for low-income riders, something WMATA is already working on with its Metro Lift program. I look forward to hearing how that program is being implemented to date. We also need to protect kids from har harmful policing tactics. As I understand it, WMATA has a policy not to enforce fare evasion for kids who appear to be 18 or younger. And we still need to improve programs like Kids Ride Free to ensure that kids have access to Metro for free without feeling the need to jump the turnstiles. As a reminder, we have a program called Kids Ride Free in the City where kids can ride completely for free on our Metro system. We need to expand the use of taller fare gates, which so far seem very effective at deterring fare evasion. And finally, we need to ensure that when police do stop people for fare evasion, they are doing so in an equitable and civil way without harmful tactics. All of these are things I believe we can and must accomplish. There's no perfect system here, but this bill and other efforts accompanying it, I believe will help us get closer to a Metro that is safe and hospitable for all. We have to act. With that, before we begin with our public testimony, I'd like to turn um, to first to my uh, Ward 3 colleague, Council Member Matt Fruman, who's with us today for any opening statement you may have. Thank you very much, Chairperson Pinto. Um, I'm gonna be in and out today, but I did wanna um, make an, an opening statement. I, I think all of the points that you made in your opening statement, Chairperson Pinto, are spot on. I do think that this is very important that we stem fair evasion for lots of different reasons. It's also a very careful balancing act. The idea of criminalizing fair evasion in and of itself, it was troubling and we shouldn't go back to that. But we need to have a system that increases confidence in the, in the metro system, makes it feel safe for everyone, makes it feel like the rules are being obeyed by all. That's, that's a very important message. We need to do it in a way that doesn't overshoot. And it does feel to me like I'll be very interested to hear the testimony that the approach that's been proposed here can work. Um, I had the benefit of meeting with representatives of the Metro Transit Police last week and heard their views on this subject and, and found it quite heartening. Uh, one of the things that I think is the case is that the system that we're talking about would be very much like the system in Montgomery County that I think has been working better. So the gates are important, but having a system where we're enforcing these rules, I, do, I also think is very important. I have to say, I'm new to this conversation. And when I look at the bill and see that there may not be a requirement to provide an ID, and it could be I'm stepping into a place where there's a very delicate balance going on, uh, I worry about the practicality of actual enforcement. So I'm going to want to hear from people on that subject because you don't want a situation where somebody is stopped, gives a name that is not a true name, and you don't have any way to know that. And so could that have an effect on the uh, on this system working? It could be that the thing to do is to start with this. And if there is a sense that that's not working, you go to another step. But 
I want something that is fair and works and helps us address these issues without criminalizing that strikes the balance that I think everybody has been looking for. We may be there, um, but I'll be curious to hear the testimony. I will be listening to the testimony even if I'm not here because I have other things that I need to go back and forth to today. But thank you very much for this opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Fruman. Really appreciate those comments and looking forward to working with you on this bill. Um, and next, we'll turn to our Ward 5 colleague, Councilmember Zachary Parker, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Pinto, um, and thank you for holding this hearing today. I will keep this brief. I appreciate the need for safety on our public transit system and the need for Metro to run a steady financial ship. That is something that is top of mind for all of us in government right now. At the same time, I, too, have questions about rolling back reforms to Metro's fare evasion enforcement powers in the district and whether or not that is the right answer to the problems facing uh, the transit system. The power to detain is not simply the power to enforce. Uh, it comes with the power to search and subject an individual to other risks in our criminal justice system. And it can result in harassment of our young people, especially who we should be encouraging to use public transit. Uh, fortunately, Metro seems to have found an alternative to enhanced enforcement that seems to be working well, new fare gates uh, by their own testimony. Metro has also made progress by its own testimony and reducing crime on the system without additional test uh, authority rather. So today the fundamental question before us is whether new authority is actually necessary and if so what safeguards need to be in place uh, to prevent this authority from resulting in negative and traumatic encounters for district residents especially our young people and especially black young people who are more at risk of negative encounters with uh, transit police. So I look forward to hearing from those testifying um, and engaging with the committee on this legislation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councilor Parker, for your comments um, and appreciate you being here today. So for today's hearing, we are first going to hear from our public witnesses to discuss the legislation before us and then from our government witnesses. Uh, as usual, the public witnesses will have three minutes to present their testimony. Those representing an organization will have five minutes. I'd like to invite our first panel of in-person public witnesses. I'll ask the first person I call to come to the seat farthest to my right, your left, um, and then, you know, second, third, third. Uh, Faye X, public witness. Carlos Andino, Associate Counsel, Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Tracy Hayden Lowe, Public Witness. Samuel Greenfield, Public Witness. All right, well, it looks like this panel is, is you. Ms. Lowe, thank you for being with us today um, and please go ahead whenever you're ready. Good morning, members of the committee and colleagues, and thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony on the District of Columbia's current statute regarding passenger conduct on public vehicles. My name is Tracy Haddon Lowe, and I'm here today testifying in my personal capacity as a resident of the District of Columbia and as an appointee of this council to the WMATA Board of Directors. But I want to be clear that the opinions I'm offering here are personal and don't represent the WMATA board or the WMATA staff or any other organization that I'm associated with. I'm here today to ask the council to correct what I believe was just a legislative error made when the council decriminalized fair noncompliance in 2018. This legislation proposes the exact same language that already exists in the DC code for pedestrians who have committed an infraction. It's just saying that that should apply to passengers on public vehicles. So this is such basic common sense that I have heard from one council member that they believe this language already applies to transit. So I'm just gonna keep my testimony short here and not like drone on and on because I hope it's clear to everyone that this is a technical correction. But if anything is unclear, I would love to clear it up today. 
cities are going through a lot of different kinds of disruptions right now related to the pandemic and subsequent economic and social shifts. And it can be difficult to understand how to respond to all of these different issues at the same time. So I remember what I always say to my kids, safety first. What is front of mind for me these days is the need for us to pursue equitable, cost-effective, and evidence-based strategies to prevent crime, advance community safety, and promote reassurance and belonging in a shared society that we are all a part of. This is the single most important thing that any city leader can be doing right now. The message we send at the Fairgate is our first impression and expectation that we set of all behavior inside our transit system. We have a lot of rules related to safety at WMATA. Stand clear of the closing doors. Maybe you've heard that one. Don't talk to the bus driver while the vehicle is moving and they are concentrating on driving. This is the little stuff, but it leads to big stuff like don't go in the tunnels or climb on top of a rail car. Don't pick fights with other passengers and so on. I have heard loudly and clearly from elected officials and the general public that they expect WMATA to enforce these rules. And so I think we're sending the wrong safety message if we say that one rule doesn't matter, but others do. That would not work on my kids, and I don't think it's going to work on anyone more grown. We need to be able to say that the rules matter in a reasonable way. And I think when fare evasion was decriminalized, we created a very clear expectation that people who got caught not paying the fare would get a ticket, right? The same thing as if a driver parks illegally, for example. The ID check language in the legislation before you today will enable WMATA to meet this expectation and issue the citations more consistently. That's what this is about. I believe that the team at WMATA is authentically, sincerely committed to serving our whole community. I'm proud of WMATA for helping us as a region create a new low-income fare program called Metro Lift. It is my hope that we can expand this program in the future, though it's already off to a strong start with more than 5,000 people enrolled. But just as WMATA is committed to serving our whole community, we need our community to be partners with us in making and keeping our system safe. That starts with shared expectations about what the rules are and reasonable interventions for what to do when an individual won't follow them. I am uncomfortable with a DC code that is stricter for pedestrians than for transit users. In most instances, our code sets a higher standard of behavior for transit, such as no smoking, because we understand that when people are in the confined spaces of a transit system, we all need to try a little harder to get along. Expecting people to offer their true name or show ID when they have it is fair. I am really appreciative of Council Members Pinto and Gray and Chairman Mendelson for introducing this legislation. Thank you. And I hope Council will advance it as quickly as possible. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Lowe, and you are um, our only witness on this panel. And so we'll, we'll get to do a round with just you and then we'll move on to our virtual witnesses. Um, so thank you very much for your testimony. I think that lays out the problem and this kind of tailored solution quite well. In terms of the pedestrian um, enforcement that you're talking about, can you elaborate a little bit on what that looks like um, for the benefit of the public in terms of the, the language and what types of um, issues that language seeks to deal with? So I'm not a lawyer and this does not represent legal advice, <laughs> but my understanding is that the DC code has a number of uh, civil infractions that a pedestrian might commit. Um, I, I myself <laughs> was once ticketed for incommoding at a protest because I stood in traffic in the street and, and I got a ticket. Um, this uh, legislation 
the that language, I think um, what it means is that like after a pedestrian, not just like for being a pedestrian, but after you commit a civil infraction, what the language says is that the pedestrian has to provide their true name. Um, similarly, like obviously I don't need an ID to walk down the street like this is America. So you just it says that you have it's this exact same language. It says you provide your true name and then you get a ticket for whatever you did with your name on it. Um, and if you refuse to provide your true name, you you can be searched to see if you have an ID. <laughs> um, but this is, it's literally the exact, it's in a separate section of the DC code, and it would only apply after a pedestrian committed an infraction, uh, like a civil infraction of some kind, but it's, it's the exact same wording. Okay. And to those conversations that you mentioned that you've been a part of where other council members may have said, Metro can already do this. Where do you think that disconnect is, is coming from and what they're already permitted to do or where the limitations in the current law are? Well, I, I think it um, I think it might come from the fact that these are like two different sections of the DC code. So like every transit user is a pedestrian, like in 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 my like kind of common sense thought, um, but the code treats them separately. So that could be a source of confusion. Another source of confusion could be that. Um, if you use transit a lot, you've probably seen our Metro Transit Police Department like out there doing stuff. Like you may have seen them stop someone and ask for ID. So that may seem like, hey, this is working. They can already do it. Um, but what we're hearing from MTPD is that um, while when a police officer stops you and asks for your ID, some people are like, oh my gosh, I gotta hand this over. Um, maybe there are other people who don't have that reaction. So this is for those like other rarer situations that maybe people haven't seen. Thank you very much, very helpful. Council Member Freeman. Uh, thank you very much. And, and the reference to the parallels with the law relating to pedestrians is helpful to me. I, I'm trying to understand how the mechanics of this will all work. But I, I think that um, Councilmember Parker's comments raise a concern. You know, this is an area where we are changing the approach in different kinds of ways. And maybe one change resulted in an outcome that is way suboptimal and another change, we don't wanna end up with an outcome that is way suboptimal. Part of the way to address that is transparency and oversight. And I'm not asking you to make a commitment on behalf of the WMATA board. You're, you're very explicitly, your own personal opinions are what we're hearing today. But I wonder if there might be ways to have transparency about the stops that are happening and an oversight subcommittee on the board, perhaps that it could include people from outside of the board to protect against the fear, the legitimate fear that Council Member Parker has raised about this sort of change being used in a way that none of us would want it to be used. So is there a way to, uh, to ensure transparency and oversight so we protect against those kinds of risks? Yeah, I, personally, I think that WMATA already has this in place, although we can take a look at it. Let me just share a little bit of information about what WMATA already has in place. My predecessor on the board was actually instrumental in um, creating a civilian oversight board that, um, like anyone who has a negative interaction with MTPD, can file a complaint, and there is a there is an oversight process for that person to be heard um, that is also transparent. Um, and so I think that um, knowing that that's in place, which has not been in place in the past, but is in place now, um, I think that that's also a positive step and it's really good to have that. Um, and then uh, my understanding is that MTPD, I, I know they already share with the board, but I think they share with the general public too, like basic statistics in terms of like the number of citations that are being issued. And um, it would be a question for MTPD about whether there's like additional granularity in that data that we might want to get. Although I think what we're talking about here might be such nuanced situations that um, 
the uh, it, it can't be captured in a statistic and we want to hear, we actually would want to hear about it through an oversight board that included all parties. Um, that's, that's really helpful. I, I, I'll close by saying, I think the council did legislation requiring transparency from the Office of Unified Command. Um, and I think that new data is actually, and it identifies problems, but it it makes them very clear and helps everybody to address it. And so, uh, similar kinds of very transparent data so that we can stay on top of this as we're making a different change, I think could be important. Maybe it exists already, but it would be important, I believe. WMATA is committed to transparency. In, and you know, some people may feel that's a relatively new development. I've only been on the board for two years, but my experience has been that there is a strong commitment to transparency and that WMATA shares information very readily. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service. Thank you, Councilmember Fruman. Um, hold on one moment. I'm going to see if Councilmember Parker may have a round for you uh, in the hot seat. Councilmember Parker, uh, go ahead for a three minute round. Thank you. Noting that Metro has posted what it calls 70% uh, reduction in fare evasion in areas that it has installed enhanced gates, what additional metrics can you point to that suggest this legislation will ensure uh, by X percentage fair evasion will go down or by X percentage crime on the transit system will go down? So for me, this is actually about preventing crime and not about fair evasion per se. Um, I think that um, we have a quarterly performance report in which we hear every quarter about what's happening in the system in terms of crime. And those numbers um, headed in the wrong direction for, for a big chunk of the last three years and only recently have some of those numbers started to turn in the right direction. Um, when we look at uh, bus operator assaults, um, that is still an area of concern for me. Um, where we, uh, I'm still not seeing all of the numbers that I would really like to see. I don't think that um, anyone can offer us a guarantee in advance that this particular uh, legislative modification um, will produce a guaranteed result of any kind. But, you know, I think there is a general sense right now that like, we all want to feel that like, when there's trouble and we call someone for help, that someone is gonna respond and that they're gonna help us. MTPD is, these are our helpers. They run towards trouble in a really heroic way every day inside our transit system. I have a lot of trust in them and this is what they're telling us they need in order to help. I, I share your concern for safety on our transit system. And I think it goes without saying that we all want residents to be safe on Metro. Walk me through a scenario. So let's say it's a young person coming to school, MTPD stops them and says, what's your name or give me your ID and they refuse. They are then detained and then what happens? So the conversations I've had with both the general manager and with MTPD about young people needing to go to school is that we want kids to go to school and we want them to be on time. <laughs> so we should be facilitating and accelerating their movement through the system, not um, uh, uh, nitpicking about, uh, you know, whether they have tapped a card on a particular day. I, I do wanna also emphasize that the way that the Kids Ride Free program works in terms of the structure of the payments that flow from the District of Columbia to WMATA is not dependent on children tapping cards every day. Once a child is enrolled in Kids Ride Free and they tap a card a single time, WMATA is paid for the, at the negotiated price for a year's worth of rides. So there is no financial concern here. We are trying to get the kids to school and we need to get them enrolled in the program. But once they're enrolled in the program, WMATA is paid and we are here to help get them to school. So um, 
I am not expecting to be, and I will be looking and watching to make sure that I'm not hearing about people stopping kids and making them late to school. I'm not expecting that to happen. What I am expecting to happen is when there are full grown adults inside the system who are jumping the fare gate and then picking fights with other passengers or whatever, that someone is stopping them, finding out their name and checking to see if maybe they don't act like this just on transit. Maybe they actually act like this all the time and have an outstanding warrant, which we could find out if we knew what their name was. Thank you. I, I am at time. I just want to note that I still don't know what would happen. And um, it would be a helpful exercise, I think, for everybody to just go through various scenarios. Let's say it's not a young person, but an adult. What then happens? How long are they detained? What is the process? What are the steps that are taken? Um, and again, I think through that, we might get to some of the concerns that it sounds like Councilmember Fruman raised uh, and that I'm raising. But I do want to thank you for your testimony. And probably MTPD is like better able to answer that question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Well, really appreciate your testimony. And thank you, Councilmember Parker. We will certainly speak um, with the chief of Metro Transit Police about some of those practicalities. Um, but again, as a reminder, the, de the detaining is only in the incidents where someone lies or is not providing their true name or address. For most of these cases, the, the best case scenario is you're stopped, you're, you have to provide your true name and address, and you're issued a civil fine, and you're on your way, and hopefully you don't do it again. Um, but this at least gives a tool that if somebody is lying about who they are or failing to engage um, with Metro Transit Police, it gives some avenue to make that enforcement mean something that, that's currently missing. Um, but thank you so much, Ms. Love, for being here and your testimony. Really appreciate it. We are going to move on to our next panel of public witnesses, all of whom are virtual. So I will call them in the order uh, you'll be called. Faye X, public witness. Carlos Andino, associate counsel, Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Samuel Greenfield, public witness. Robert Pittman, first district, police citizens advisory council. Robert Vincent Branham, public witness. And Alex B, public witness. Give you all a moment to join. Bay X, I see you in the attendees, but if you need to accept uh, joining us, oh, here we go. All right, Bay X, public witness, whenever you're ready. Okay, we're going to move on to Carlos Andino, and we'll come back to you. Um, just turn your your video, your sound on um, to signify you're ready. Carlos Andino, Associate Counsel, Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Thank you. The Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs recommends this council vote down the Metro Safety Act of 2023. I've heard the opening remarks speak about striking the perfect balance between safety and Metro accessibility and allowing people to ride the Metro and reach their destinations. However, this bill does not meet that threshold. Um, and it's not reaching that threshold for three reasons. The first is the real impact of this bill is gonna be more residents living in poverty and being incarcerated um, and more people of color being brutalized by the police. The second reason is this bill has nothing to do with safety. And third, fair enforcement will not save WMATA from financial ruin. To my first point, the real impact of the Metro Safety Amendment Act will be a decrease in safety for people living in poverty and people in color, of color. This council has recognized fair evasion enforcement has predominantly impacted people of color in the district. And allowing police to detain individuals for fair evasion will undoubtedly lead to increase of people of color being placed in police custody. And studies have shown 
that people of color, especially Black Americans, placed in custody are more likely to face severe criminal and physical harm. Past examples of Metro Police detaining individuals and holding them for fair evasion have resulted in incarceration, physical injuries, and even death. And these will be highlighted later in testimony provided by the Public Defender Service. The potential risk of harm is significantly higher for those residents without a home address who won't be able to tell the police an address or their true name and therefore will remain in police custody with no clear end in sight. The council decriminalized fair evasion when it recognized enforcement was not worth the severe harm the city was placing on people living in poverty and people of color. And those facts have not changed. Under the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023, enforcement will not end at a fine. It will be more DC residents being seized by the police, more residents living in poverty being arrested, and more people of color being physically harmed. These costs on DC residents' lives are not worth the benefits, especially when those benefits have nothing to do with safety and nothing to do with saving WMATA from financial ruin. To my second point, the council in its introduction of this bill offered no statistical evidence to support the link of serious crime and fair evasion together. Rather, it made a dangerous assumption. Those who fair evade must be inclined to commit more crimes. Now, I, recommend, I recognize that Councilmember Pimpto brought up a new statistic that 97% of violent offenders have fair evaded. I'm not familiar with that um, statistic and I would love to take a look at it. But other uh, strategies have been shown as been st stated before to reduce crime in the Metro and reduce fare evasion, the gates, 70% reduction. And I think we should track more closely how that has led to a reduction in crime within the Metro. At the end of the day, it is not clear and there is no causal link between fare evasion and, and violent crimes on the Metro. And without this type of meaningful evidence-based approach, the council should not respond to this call for change um, and instead should do a deeper analysis. The reality of it is the overwhelming majority of fair evaders never go on to commit serious crimes. And without evidence to the contrary, this will lead to impacts on people of color and those living in poverty in this city. To my final point, Ramada is facing a $750 million financial cliff. Increased fair evasion enforcement will not save Ramada. According to Ramada's own study, fair evasion accounts for a small percentage of this financial cliff. And when identifying drivers for the reason the cliff exists, WMATA does not even cite fare evasion, nor does WMATA cite fare enforcement in its plan to save itself from financial ruin. The reality is not even WMATA says fare enforcement will save it from financial ruin. WMATA has pointed to direct ways other jurisdictions have managed to save themselves from financial ruin. Real solutions require this council to consider the, to take on larger funding projects seriously and not be distracted by screams that will not address the issue. Even with perfect fare enforcement, revenue generated will come nowhere close to what the Metro needs to save itself. And the council should not use fare evaders as scapegoats for modest problems. Instead, we should focus on real evidence-based approach. Lastly, I wanna briefly touch on transparency because this enforcement by police will not be transparent. The Washington Lawyers Committee has extensive experience submitting FOIA requests and trying to get more data about Metro Police. Our experience has led to FOIA requests being ignored and waiting years for FOIA requests to be fulfilled and gain more information. Metro Police do not have a near act for us to give close oversight and understand the actions of Metro Police. And for these reasons, the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs recommends the council should vote down the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andino. Next, we'll turn to Samuel Greenfield, public witness. Robert Pittman, First District Police Citizens Advisory Council. Good morning, Chairwoman um, Pinto, uh, to staff and to uh, Metro Transit authorities who are, who are present. And to the into the community, um, I appear here today as an individual. These will be my own personal comments, and not the comments of of my first district CAC. Um, 
I'm having a lot of trouble with Bill uh, 25318, the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023. Um, I don't believe that it's enforceable. I don't believe that if if it's prosecuted by an, a, a DC attorney general, that they would even take the cases. I don't believe a US attorney would take the cases. Why? For a number of reasons. Um, one, you're not requiring anyone to truly identify themselves and you're detaining people. Um, in, in, the, in my concern with detaining someone, um, we could end up detaining too many people and tying up the court system, even though those cases may end up being no paper. A hundred dollar fine does not necessarily mean that someone will not um, will not commit the offense. And I can't find any data anywhere in the country that shows that it's a true deterrent. Um, the fiscal impact statement that the council adopts I would offer that you really need a WMATA statement, a physical impact statement, or an independent audit to determine exactly what the true cost to detaining people would be. Um, in addition to that, when you look at the crime stats that are available, and I look at Metro crime stats every, almost every day, uh, we see where the high for Metro's calls for service and for our fare evasions in, tw in, in 2018 were very high, but they have come down even though we're no we know they're going up. There were 72,000 calls for service in 2018 and there was 74,000, uh, well, 52,000 in 2022. So we do see a change. I think part of what if I can take another 30 seconds, I, I think what is important is for Metro Transit police officers to engage people in a less threatening way than what currently happens. And when they stand on post at Gallery Place or some of the other stations, it's important to know what's going on around you because sometimes there's activity that's happening around you that they don't see. And so, uh, hopefully my testimony and some of the articles that I have provided in that testimony will be helpful to this discussion, but I, I don't think this bill achieves what is intended, even though I appreciate the efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pittman. Robert Vincent Branham, public witness. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the council. My name is Robert Benson Branham, and I am President Emeritus of the DC Federation of Civic Association, Chairman Emeritus of the 5th District Citizen Advisory Council, and also Chair of the Public Safety Committee for the Ward 5 Leadership Council. I uh, support, in theory, and the goal of the legislation. Metro fare payments should be uh, should be paid. The issue I have is with enforce with the enforcement mechanism, particularly if the offense of this particular bill committed reference to this particular bill is committed by someone who happens to uh, evade payment of fares in Maryland or Virginia, and how the district law would uh, um, uh, apply to that person and uh, to jurisdiction. So my issue is not with uh, um, absolving people from fair evasion. People should not be evading fares. And I don't, do not believe that evading fares and prosecuting persons for evading fares somehow or another is racist or is somehow or another promoting massive incarceration. It's just respecting the laws of the District of Columbia. However, there is an issue of, 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 of proper enforcement. If the, if the person who evades the fare is 15 years old, would that person be uh, charged in the same manner 
as someone who's 51 years old uh, and evades and, and, and evades, evades, evades the fear. Uh, they, because children who are a child 15 years old can say, I'm a child, I'm going to school. And in theory, I, don't, I just don't have my card to, 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 ride, to ride free. But, a, but someone who's, who's 51 years old uh, and decides to jump, jump the rails is, pros, is, is prosecuted. And then how does that effort to prosecute and detain someone impact the other passengers and the other uh, 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 schedule of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the system? So for me, I need clarity on the uh, jurisdiction and enforcement mechanism Although I I strongly support uh, enforcing the uh, the payment of fares for Metrorail, the Metrorail is not a free system. The government of the District of Columbia cannot pay for everyone to ride free, particularly if they board in Maryland and Virginia, or, or go, it, it simply doesn't work for me. But uh, in theory, I support the legislation. I'm just concerned about proper. Uh, 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 jurisdiction and, and enforcement. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Branham. Alex B, public witness. So you want to make it a $100 fine. This is for people who can't afford to pay. And so your solution to poverty and crime and desperation, the ridiculous things that happen in DC, like a teenager waiting in the Circle 7 store to shoot and execute someone or people throwing a suitcase with a man's body in the dumpster or 60 year old men trying to steal copper from the pepco power plant and many much more nonsense in the courts all the time you instead of passing through the reparations or sending some trauma relief therapy or free metro cards uh, should be free metro free college for everybody in the capital of the richest country in the world with one hundred seventy thousand dollars salaries for council and staff, but how about at least free Metro cards for the descendants of chattel slavery, the people that built the capital little white got paid because the Freedmen's Bureau shut down after two years and you want to increase the fine. According to your press release, end cycles of violence by nutrient dense food at the jail and the hospitality program. Great, that's it. If the inmates will just eat their veggies, they could be a chef or a butler or something and park the cars for the white hotel guests, not to mention that you're increasing this rebuttable presumption trying to keep black people in the DC jail where people die. Another inmate just died recently and they also keep people at the hospital where somebody just walked across the hall at Dowdle sleeping in his room to death because they're crazy people in there. I don't think the veggies is going to save them. How about since you're giving the Metro billions of dollars to the police, you try to make sure they stop killing black people instead of trying to increase jump outs where white officers are jumping out, scaring black people. And you want to propose something that the judges are writing into you and saying that this is unconstitutional. How are the cops supposed to know which person is on parole or not? Stop and frisk. That's the Rudy Giuliani school of governing from the 90s. You are increasing these interactions actions in this metro fine will people that can jump over this new fence fair gate that you've also doubled in size should get a reward like doing the long jump in the olympics or we did in gym class the school to prison pipeline you're adding more security or cops around the schools making it feel like a prison when we know that these are already segregated all black schools except for like a couple school without walls is mixed White people like me in the suburbs, I had no cops ever in my school. So once again, you're punching down on poor people with bills with these ridiculous acronyms and fake politics. Six, root cause of these crimes, the have and have nots. You go to college, law school, you're safe pretty much. These kids are not safe from violence, the cops, the school to prison pipeline. You'll just be signing and approving more settlements. Why not fund the $750 a month guaranteed income for low-income Black families with kids in Ward 7 and 8 under the CJCC proposal? How does a free breakfast help you with your meetings? How would a free Metro card help the people? Be an ally, not a white supremacist. What would Harriet Tubman do? Read the California Reparations Report. Remembering Elijah McClain, the jury people. And the DC Justice Lab said the bill is intended 
to hunt and hold people who look like they've been hunted and held before. In DC, that's exclusively black people, poor people, and native Washingtonians. This does nothing regarding the actual bad things on the Metro, like an FBI agent intervening in an argument and shooting someone in the Metro or perverts, stabbers, et cetera, which the police already respond to those incidents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Faye X, I want to give you another opportunity if you've been able to join. I am present. Hi. Okay, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I am here um, specifically to speak out against the bill that is in question currently. Um, as someone just spoke to right before me, I think it is important to recognize that we are speaking about the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable populations in Washington, D.C. And if they're not paying the fares, how are they going to pay a hundred dollar citation? Will they pay a hundred dollar citation? Does it now mean that because of the hundred dollar citation, they are more at risk of more interactions with the justice system? Criminalizing poor people is not how we get to a freer D.C., that is not how we get to a safer metro. And I've heard a lot, of, a lot of rhetoric around particularly free transportation. Transportation should obviously be free in any society that values its citizens and values the wealth of all people, right? Because what do we know poverty's definition is? The definition of poverty is immobility, right? And so the literal thing to combat poverty is transportation. You are proposing to make it even more difficult for the people who already find it the hardest to get on Metro to do so. You're making it criminal for them to do so when it's already true that so many acts are criminalized by Metro Transit Authority as well as MPD. Everybody who uses the Metro knows that there are police officers everywhere, that there's constant contact with each of the police forces when you are trying to ride the Metro, when you are trying to use any city resources. And so when we know that, why can we not also understand that more policing, more criminalization likely is not going to be how we actually fix the problem. And especially if we're saying that the problem itself is that the Metro doesn't have enough money, then why don't we fund it? Especially when we know that fares are not going to fund it adequately, even if they're all paid, even if the deficit was fully cleared and everybody paid, right? So that means that the system itself is running on a deficit, right? It has nothing to do with the fare evasion. It is literally a system that is not built to sustain itself financially. And we, as DC folks who live here and use the Metro and rely on the Metro, we're the ones who suffer for it. And so I implore you today, do not pass this bill, pass immediate funds to make sure that WMATA is accessible and not criminalizing the most marginalized and at risk in our communities, particularly children, as we know happened with the last time that we criminalized fair evasion, they were most at risk of arrest and fines and also our poor folks and unhoused comrades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses on this panel. Um, I do have a couple of questions and you know, a number of you raised concerns around um, incarceration or people being detained without a release date or indefinitely. And I just want to make sure just to re-clarify that this is a civil fine, um, hopefully all, but the vast majority of these cases will be handled by Metro Plans Transit Police saying, you have fare evaded, and I now need your name and your ID, your address in order to issue a civil fine. Um, the case of being detained or being um, held for the day until your true address could be ascertained is in the circumstance if someone lies, if someone is not willing to cooperate. Um, and that tool is part of the... Uh, calculation here and figuring out how to make civil enforcement mean something. We can have, and we should have, 
a larger conversation in our city about free transportation. Um, but in a system that we don't have free transportation, we I don't believe we can just say, well, then then rules are not going to be followed. And so I wanted to ask you, Mr. Andino, about this um, kind of alternative. Under our current system, um, you know, what what would you suggest be done when people are ferivating? And I also want to say, just for the record, I agree with you, as I said in my opening statement, that the vast majority of people who fare evade do not commit crime on the system. It is the vast majority of people who commit crime on the system that have also fare evaded. That is a, a larger public safety point. But in terms of this issue of just um, many, many people jumping the turnstiles, a feeling of disorder on the system, what would you propose um, that we do about that? Thank you for the question. If I can go back to your earlier point real quick related to individuals hopefully cooperating with the system and not facing penalties. Um, the reality is in DC under the DC code, an individual can be held for civil contempt for up to six months. That means that if an individual lies or for the matter of fact, just doesn't have an address to give the police, they can be held and detained for a long period of time. So while we acknowledge that the vast majority of people won't be held for very long periods of time, we have to think about those who will be impacted. And one individual spending several months locked up because they failed to pay a $2 fine is not fair in a system where fair evasion and fair enforcement is not going to solve the financial issues that we face. Again, you spoke and everyone in the panel before spoke about a balance and act that needs to be performed. And this is not balanced. Now, to your point about what to do when somebody fair evades, I, I and the Washington Lawyers Committee, of course, wants to measure to have as much funding as possible. And the reality is, again, it's a balance and act. If we can prevent people from jumping over the fair gates in the first place, that is a front for deterrent. This council also previously considered making buses free for DC residents. The vast, vast majority, over 80% of fare evasions occur on the buses. It's impossible that Metro Transit Police are going to patrol the millions of bus trips that happen every year and enforce the fare. So we should think of practical solutions and that's where most of the funds are being lost. This council should seriously consider making the buses free as it previously introduced. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Pittman and Mr. Branham, you both talked a little bit about the kind of enforceability uh, of this provision. Can you both elaborate a little bit more on what your concerns are there, and if you think there should be changes to make these provisions more uh, fairly enforceable. Thank you. Let me uh, uh, jump in, uh, if I may, uh, and my good friend, uh, Bobby. Uh, first, let me say this. As an African-American man born, educated, and raised in the District of Columbia, growing up in Southeast Washington, Marshall Heights near the shrimp boat, you know, raised with five people in a one bedroom house, apartment. I understand and I have lived in, quote, poverty situations. My mother, however, raised four children. All of them have college degrees. I find it offensive that somehow or another that my race reflects, justifies bad behavior. The law says pay the fare. You know, pay the fare. And I find it odious, odious, that individuals will come here and somehow justify and equate being black with being poor. No. That has not, that, that's not it. That is not it. And I take a backseat to no one in, in fighting against poverty and saying that and, and, and saying that poverty is should not be a crime. No one, at least that I know of, actually believes that being poor means that you're a crime, you're, you're a criminal. But the district government does not cover and pay for or provide for free transportation on its bus rails, on buses or, or trains. It doesn't do that. 
it had, the funding has to come from somewhere. And the enforcement has to be a measurable and, 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 and accountability. If you evade fair, you assume, and you let people just go ahead and do that, then basically you're saying that the laws don't matter in the District of Columbia. You know, you may not like it, but that's the law. Change the law. Change the law. And using a uh, Harriet Tubman as somehow as a pretext to say this justify persons baiting the law, I, I find offensive. And I find it disrespectful to the memory of Harriet Tubman and all the other Black Americans who fought for freedom in this city and this nation. That somehow or another, that because you're black, you can you can you you can you can you can commit crimes and claim it on being poor. No, I've been there. I've been there. You know, I've been arrested twice for statehood. So don't tell me or don't don't try to tell me that somehow or another that 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 I that I don't support poor people. Uh, I think that being poor makes you a criminal. No. No. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Branham. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move on to Councilor Parker for his round, but Mr. Pittman, we'll, we'll come back to you if you have other thoughts to add on this um, afterwards. Go ahead, Councilor Parker. I will include you in my questions. Um, I too have questions about how this will be enforced. Questions that come up for me is what happens if someone refuses to give their name? How do you prove that someone has given you their accurate name? How do you prove that the ID that someone gives you is in fact accurate? I, I asked the Metro representative earlier, uh, what happens if it's a young person? Let's say it's an adult that's 25. How long should they be detained? What is that process? Um, and so many of the concerns you've raised in your testimony, I think uh, are fair and I share those questions. I also, wonder why are we not seeing the same intense focus on buses and those that would seek to sneak on buses at the same rate. Um, let me ask you, are there any ways that you think we could make this enforceable or do you think there is no way to in fact enforce what this bill is proposing? Is, is that to me? Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, Pittman, yeah, that's for you. Thank Thank you, Council and, and if you want to take, let's say, 30 seconds to a minute to get to what you were going to say before, feel free. Thank you, sir. I, I think I can do it in 30 seconds. So um, I, I won't regurgitate what my my friend, um, Mr. Branham, has said or what the Washington Lawyers uh, Committee and others have said. What I would say is this. Um, I, I I know that prosecutors ethically are not going to take on a case that's that's that simply, you know, is fraught with uh, with problems. So, that being said, one of the things that I've looked at is, you know, what other metrics can we have to determine what are actually our issues? And I think part of the problem is we don't we don't really have all of the facts. We don't we don't have all of the data. How long would you detain a person? It's it's not even just. Uh, promulgating legislation, it's the policies and the regulations that are going, are going to come out of that. And since we don't always know what WMATA is doing in terms of their policy and regulations, we can't track it. And uh, that's that's going to be an issue. And I wonder. I mean, if I I, understand, I agree with Mr. Brandon, we, we you know, if you get on the metro or you get on the bus, you need to pay. But if they're not. My greatest concern is the interaction they're going to have with Metro Transit police officers. Metro Transit police officers, in all respect to Metro Transit officials that I work with and Mr. Branham works with, they're not in the Metropolitan Police Department. It's different. And until we address the basic cultural issues that go on within that organization and how they approach people, I am very fearful that contact will turn into uh, more aggression and that aggression will become a rest and will overcrowd an already burdensome system and also place people in, in custody that in my opinion shouldn't be in custody. I, I'll end with this. I really think the focus should be on 
understanding what is the cost to get on a metro train and travel from one station to the next station? What is the actual cost? How do we integrate that into the overall cost of the system? At the same time, understanding that people should pay their fares. No, I really appreciate that. Mr. Andino, are there proxies that this committee and the council would be better served at looking at and addressing that may indicate that someone has propensity to engage in violence on Metro? Thank you for the question, council member. There are several uh, propensities, I believe is the word you use, that individuals, officers, detectives can look at um, in order to turn, determine somebody's propensity, propensity to commit violence. Um, fare evasion, as far as I understand, there's been no significant studies to show propensity of fare evasion and crime. There may be some correlation, as Councilmember uh, Pinto brought up earlier. Um, but rather, we should be looking at the circumstances surrounding when crime is committed. Um, propensities like the, the wealth that an individual has, the living situations that they have, and when and how they interact with our metro system. Unfortunately, we have a large and unhoused population that relies on the metro for shelter a lot of times and use the transportation as well for means to get around. We should be looking at means to help those individuals to advance their social status so that they don't end up in a situation where they may be more likely to commit a crime. Thank you. And I just want to underscore what has already been said. In no ways do I think I'm hearing people justify people breaking the law. I think many of us would also agree if if there's a fair folks should pay it. The question then is before us, what do you do with this legislation and how does it in fact play out? So that would just be a reoccurring thing I keep coming to uh, through today's hearing. But thank you all for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Mr. Pittman, did you have anything else to add or were you able to address it with Councilmember Parker? Uh, the, uh, well, the, uh, thank you for that. Um, the, the only other thing that I, that I would want to add is um, perhaps as it's slightly been discussed or, or brought up is how do we look at behaviors? Um, I think when uh, Chief Anzello comes up, he needs to talk about how the how Metro Transit officers are trained to understand patterns. How do we identify in when you're in the airport or when you're in train stations and other places? There is um, there's facial recognition, and I know there's controversy with, with facial recognition. But if we're able to identify certain people who have created patterns, then perhaps we can ask them what are the social reasons what what are the reasons why they're doing what they're doing i don't want to just arrest people that i that is not where i'm coming from what i wanted to understand is what are the reasons why these things are happening and how do we help divert them to uh, uh better behavior so i'll end with that and you know um that's that's the point i okay. think i want to get across okay thank you well, thank you all very much for your testimony. I really appreciate your perspectives on um, being here today. Thank you, ma'am. There are no uh, further public witnesses today, so we are going to move on to our government witnesses, which we'll call as one panel. Michael Anzalo, Chief of the Metro Transit Police Department, and Katerina Seminova, Special Counsel for Policy and Legislation, Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Welcome. Thank you both for being here. As you know, it's the tradition of this committee to swear in all government witnesses who appear before it. So if I could ask you both to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to provide before the Council of the District of Columbia and this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you both. I will now invite each of you to make an opening statement beginning with Chief Anzalo. Good, okay, all right. 
Good morning, Chairwoman Pinto and members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. My name is Mike Anzello, Chief of the Metro Transit Police. I'm accompanied by Mr. Leroy Jones, Senior Vice President of Bus Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on, be on the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023. As you know, the decriminalization of fare evasion in the District of Columbia severely limits MPD, MTPD's ability to enforce fare evasion. Since the law was enacted, enacted Metro has seen an increase in serious crimes. When fare evasion enforcement peaked at 18,804 citations in 2017, serious crime dropped when compared to the previous year. In 2019 and 2020, fare evasion enforcement decreased and serious crime began to increase again. At Metro, like other transit properties, ferry evasion enforcement is essential for preventing other crimes and stopping dangerous individuals from entering and exiting the system. This amendment act corrects a technical issue which impacts our shared goal of providing the safest system for our community. Under the current statute, if officers want to write a citation, there is no mechanism in the statute that requires ferry evaders to provide their true identity. MTPD officers cannot compel a person who ferry evades to provide their name and address because the civil citation does not allow for that. Although MTPD officers can request compliance with the issuance of citations, there are no repercussions in the current statute for failing to truthfully identify themselves or comply with the issuance of the citation. Uh, just for the, the committee's note, I will submit statistical data for the record on pre and post decriminalization crime data. The fair, the fair evasion statute directed the officer, the Office of Administrative Hearings to create a process aligned with the change to a civil penalty. That process was not put in place for over two years after the bill was passed. In late 2022, we'll model coordinated with DC Office of Administrative Hearings to develop a civil infraction process for fair evasion. To date, less than 1% of the issued citations have been paid and none have been adjudicated. As you mentioned earlier, between January and June of this year, the Metro Riders Advisory Council interviewed 100 riders and nearly 40 of the 100 people were concerned about fair evasion. While the research was somewhat unscientific, it, provi it provided a glimpse of riders' concerns. Riders indicated that witnessing fare evasion on a frequent basis was unfair for customers who were paying. Fare evasion is an excess to crime within the metro system, especially violent crime. Recent study that we conducted from January, 20, from January 1st, 2023 through September 12th, 2023, has shown that 97% of the offenders who committed violent crimes that we could verify on video the crimes were murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, and weapons offenses. They fare evaded. There's also a direct correlation between fair enforcement and serious crime. From 2016 until 2019, MTPD increased enforcement for fare evasion in public conduct ordinances, and serious crime went down. Crime rates have risen since 2019 when fare evasion was decriminalized and there were no consequences for evading a fare based upon the current law. The increased enforcement and presence resulted in, I'm sorry. While crime is a community and regional concern, customers should feel safe on Metro. And that means using every tool at our disposal, investing in the community and partnering with local resources for essential services. We want to ensure all customers and employees feel safe and secure using the Metro system. We are seeing a decrease in crime currently. MTPD's crime reduction strategies include four transformation projects, regional opportunity partnerships with other law enforcement agencies, and an increase in special police officer staffing within stations within the District of Columbia. Fair gate enforcement and fair grade infrastructure changes, increased visibility, increased visibility with crisis intervention specialists and their special police officers, and enhanced community outreach. The increased enforcement of presence has resulted in decrease in some serious crimes and some misdemeanors. Also, point of entry policing is fair evasion. Policing has reduced crime and disorderly conduct on the metro system. Fair enforcement has increased year to date since last year. MTBD has made progress in, as far as clearance rates go and has a higher closure rate in solving cases than national averages. In 2022, MTPD established the Community Services Bureau to establish trust and demonstrate a working rapport with our customers in the greater community. MTPD is continually present at Metro and bus stations, supporting community events, school seminars and assemblies, and area-wide functions in conjunction with various agencies across the DC, Maryland, and Virginia locations. The Community Services Bureau team consisting of Youth Services Division and Community Outreach and Engagement Officers. The MTPD Community Services Bureau conducts extensive community outreach and engagement 
to create effective partnerships and relationships. The Community Services Bureau conducted safety presentations and demonstrations at schools, partnered with District Maryland and Virginia schools to provide mentoring to students, collaborated with DC public schools on Kids Ride Free and Safe Passage, initiated holiday outreach initiatives during Christmas and Thanksgiving, and recently the Community Services Bureau hosted an inaugural back to school event at Fort Totten Metro Station where over 1,500 people attended and received backpacks and other items to start their school year. The Community Services Bureau of the Metro Transit Police Department also partners with the DC Office of the Attorney General and restorative justice programs. These are just some of the things that we have undertaken here recently. Since the pandemic, MTPD has seen a 40% increase in people in need of mental health assistance. Metro has hired crisis intervention, intervention specialists trained in mental health awareness and de-escalation methods. They're paired with an MTPD officer operating staff to respond to customers with mental health disorders, intellectual development disabilities, and are put in touch with local area resources to get services. The men and women of the Metro Transit Police are committed to its mission of safety and protection, building trust, and providing quality service to promote safety and professionalism. As you mentioned about financial implications, fare evasion on the Metro Rail Metro bus is also a financial issue. We estimate that more than 40 million in revenue or nearly 22% of the expected deficit for the following fiscal, fiscal year was lost in 2022. And just to be note, the fines that Metro levies for fare evasion and public conduct crimes in Maryland, DC, Virginia, Metro does not get the money from those fines. That all goes to the local jurisdiction. So our actions to address fare evasion. Despite the limitations of the law, Metro has taken proactive measures to reduce fare evasion. In October 2022, Metro launched a system-wide warning campaign focusing on fare evasion and fines associated with failure to pay fare. The campaign included media outreach, signage, and officers stationed at fare gates and bus terminals with handouts. Thousands of handouts were distributed throughout the month at dozens of stations throughout the three jurisdictions. Starting in November 2022, Metro Transit Police scheduled more than a dozen enforcement events at stations throughout all three jurisdictions. These events were designed for maximum visibility and compliance, utilizing a large number of officers, ranking officials, and prominent signage. The warning campaign ended and the system-wide enforcement began in November. Metro also explored other, member, other methods that will prevent customers from entering rail stations and buses without paying. In November 2022, Metro began testing fare gate modifications in rail stations as a preventative measure. Prototypes were developed and installed at selected rail stations for employees to evaluate. Some of the modifications included tactile deterrence on top of fare gates and higher barriers. After testing multiple prototypes and getting feedback from customers, the new fare gate design is having its intended effect in reducing fare evasion. The new fare gate technology will allow Metro to measure the scale of the problem more accurately. Preliminary data shows that the new higher fare gates are reducing evasion, fare evasion by more than 70%. At the first stations where they have been installed, including Fort Taunton, Pentagon City, Bethesda, Vienna, Mount Vernon Square, and Addison Road. Metro is now publishing both paid and unpaid ridership data on its in online ridership portal to provide tra transparency of effectiveness of fare evasion reduction strategies, a more complete picture of total ridership to the public. Metro is also exploring other methods that will prevent customers from entering rail stations without paying such as installing CCTV monitors at stations. I want to take a moment to clear up some mis common misunderstanding about fare evasion in youth. MTPD do not cite individuals under the 18, 18 years of age for fare evasion. And I can explain that later uh, with your, some of your questions. In closing, this amendment will serve as a tool officers can use to keep violent criminals from using the metro, to commit violent crimes and victimize innocent persons. Additionally, by enforcing fares, individuals with outstanding warrants can be apprehended, keeping Metro and the communities we serve safer from these criminals. Metro strongly supports this legislation. We, pre we appreciate Chairwoman Pinto's leadership on this issue and ensuring that employees and customers can safely travel in the Metro rail system, Metro bus system. We will continue to work with the council on this and other public safety initiatives. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Chief Anzalo. Next, we will turn to Katya Seminova, Special Counsel for Policy and Legislation, Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Katerina Seminova, Special Counsel on Policy and Legislation at the Public Defender Service. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. 
PDS opposes the Metro Safety Amendment Act of 2023. These amendments will essentially recriminalize fare evasion, an offense that the council decriminalized in 2018 because failing to pay a $2 fare was resulting in police violence and devastating consequences that were inflicted almost exclusively on black adults and youth. This legislation will give police arbitrary discretion to detain community members, again resulting in grave harm and detention as a result of a failure to pay. The proposed changes are not necessary to stop evasion. They're the wrong way to ensure that our transit system is adequately funded and they will not advance safety in the metro system. The, community, the committee report for the Fair Evasion Decriminalization Amendment Act of 2018 detailed a litany of the harms that stem from criminalizing fair evasion. The committee report in 2018 described that in August 2018, Metro Transit Police Department officers pepper sprayed a group of young black students who allegedly fair evaded, requiring one student to receive cardiopulmonary resuscitation. In May 2018, officers grabbed and held down a 24-year-old African-American woman for allegedly refusing commands to stop after fair evading. As multiple officers held her down and participated in this stop, her breasts were exposed. Individuals in the gathered crowd took cell phone video, offered officers clothing to help the woman, and one person spit at police. MTPD officers charged her not only with fair evasion, but also with assault on a police officer. In April 2017, a man who was holding a one-year-old child was arrested for fair evasion and assault on a police officer for conduct stemming from that interaction. A report by the Washington Lawyers Committee shows that between 2016 and 2018, 91% of the citations and summonses issued for fair evasion were issued to black people. Black youth under age 25 received 46% of all citations issued, despite the eligibility of all district students for kids ride free cards. Black children as young as seven have been stopped for fair evasion. This is all from the committee report. It should be clear to the council that the Metro Safety Amendment Act is not a common sense way to collect fines. It is a backdoor recriminalization of fair evasion and will once again lead to police stops that can result in violence, community harm, and criminal convictions. This amendment requires individuals to provide a true name and address for the purposes of including that information on a notice of infraction, but it does not require individuals to display any documentary proof of name or address. Under the amendment, an individual who refuses to provide a true name and address or who knowingly provides an incorrect name or address shall upon conviction be fined $100. But it's not just a matter of a fine. These amendments would allow police to arrest and transport an individual anytime police believe that an individual has failed to provide a true name and address. The legislation is silent on the treatment of individuals who do not have an address. As written, individuals without an address could immediately be subject to detention. These amendments bring back the legal framework of fair evasion that created so much harm and disproportionate policing of black residents. With this amendment, Metro Transit Police can stop a woman who is traveling with her, uh, um, who is traveling for suspicion of fair evasion. They can ask her for name and address. If she provides her name and address and Metro Transit Police officers do not believe it to be a true name, they can arrest her, handcuff her, call Child and Family Services to take custody of any children, and then take her to police district to a police district for fingerprinting. In making the arbitrary decision to detain her for giving a false name, officers could say that she paused for a long time before giving the name, or that children were surprised by the name, or that first she gave one address and then corrected herself and gave another. In each such instance where officers do not actually know the individual and their address, they could come up with justifications for their disbelief. Even if the arrest is later held to be unconstitutional, the harm of the detention and police interaction would have already occurred. This is because the law would give police nearly unfettered discretion over whether to arrest individuals. With this much police discretion, individuals who have identification and who choose to show it may be able to prove to police that they are giving true information. But individuals who do not have identification, like the majority of youth, would then be subject to arrest, handcuffing, searches into or incident to arrest, police transport and detention. Prior to the decriminalization of fair evasion in 2018, it was the exercise of police discretion in deciding to arrest people that led to physical confrontations, violence, community outrage, and often baseless charges of assault on a police officer. In addition to those harms, these arrests came with potential collateral consequences or with the loss of release and parole and supervised release cases. The council should not go backward and once again allow arrest for conduct stemming from fair evasion. Further, despite the talk about Metro's bleak financial circumstances, this trampling of individual rights in the name of revenue is not necessary. WMATA has seen a dramatic decrease of fare evasion with the installation of new fare gates. 
In August 2023, two months after the introduction of this legislation, WMATA reported that ferry evasion decreased by 84% at the Mount Vernon station after the installation of new ferry gates. Other stations saw a decrease in ferry evasion of more than 70% with the installation of new ferry gates. The majority of stations with retrofitted ferry gates had no TAP percentages of less than 2%. WMATA has stated that all stations will receive the retrofitted fare gates over the course of the next year, meaning by midsummer 2024. These fare gates appear to so significantly reduce fare evasion that the council should question whether the harms of arrest, conviction, and recreation of a system that caused police violence justify the mere potential of having a better means to collect revenue. And I, I believe it was reported earlier that nine that there was nine percent um, no tap prior to these gates. So this would lower it um, to prior to the levels of, de of decriminalization. There's also much more that WMATA and the council can do to step up efforts to help the main causes of ferry evasion, namely the inability to afford transit costs and barriers to accessing WMATA's reduced or free fare programs. Every child in the district is entitled to ride all trains and buses for free with their kids ride free card. However, rollout of the cards is often slow and depends on parents requesting cards and schools distributing them. There's not a system where every child is given a kid's ride free card on their first day of school. Also, unlike um, nearly all other passengers, youth are not able to load the cards onto smartphones. Adults who want to enroll in Metrolift, the reduced fare program that WMATA launched just in June, 2023, must show that they're receiving benefits through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, in order to qualify. Anyone without an immigration is an eligible for SNAP, without an immigration status is ineligible for SNAP and therefore categorically excluded from Metrolift. Returning citizens must also go through SNAP application, the SNAP application process and therefore cannot immediately show the information necessary for Metrolift. The council should partner with WMATA to remove these barriers to program participation and expand existing programs, for example, by increasing the number of colleges and universities that participate in UPASS and making that program year round. PDS also wants to address the safety issues that WMATA brought up in 2018, and again now with respect to fare evasion. WMATA has stated that 99.5% of the people who commit criminal acts in the metro system fare evade. This correlation is not causation. Entry without paying the fare does not cause individuals to commit criminal offenses. Prior to the installation of fare gates, according to WMATA, 39% of individuals who entered the system at Addison Road failed to pay the fare. A tiny fraction of those individuals may have later been accused or convicted of an offense committed within the metro system. Just as in 2018, um, in the committee report, there's no causal relationship between crime committed in the metro system and fare evasion. As the Judiciary Committee noted in 2018, the committee takes assault on transit operators very seriously, but they're continuing to occur regardless of increased fare evasion enforcement, even as system-wide crime is down and fare evasion enforcement is up. Assaults on uh, exponentially, assaults on bus drivers are also up 20%. Just as the committee recommended then in 2018, Metro and the council would be better served by identifying the driving factors of crime in the system rather than identifying conditions that are sometimes present when crimes are committed. Some of those, um, finally, if the council moves forward with some legislation, despite the overwhelming evidence that WMATA has addressed fare evasion on Metro Rail through infrastructure modernization, then council action should be tailored to the problem it purports to solve. The need to receive revenue from riders. The reform should not create a pathway to detention, searches, and arrests, and it should not be an, an, a reason for more stop and frisk policing. Like the legislation that decriminalized street vending, amendments around fare evasion should specify that enforcement officers may not make an arrest and that detention should be no longer than the time necessary to identify a person for the purpose of giving a notice of civil infraction. Further, the legislation should specify that fingerprinting is not necessary in order to identify the individual for the purpose of the citation and that where identity is questioned by police, individuals may prove identity by demonstrating any indicia of their name or address, for example, with paperwork like a homework assignment or a text or email on their smartphone. PDS's written testimony includes proposed language. In conclusion, since WMATA is effectively controlling fare evasion with new physical barriers that will be in place system-wide in short order, the council should not take this step at this time. In the last three months, WMATA has also rolled out programs to make Metro more affordable for some residents with low incomes. These programs should be, get, should be expanded and given a chance to work. PDS is available to work with the committee and welcomes any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you both very much um, for your testimony. And are you going to be um, assisting with answering questions? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and swear you in as well. <clears throat> So if you could raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm under, and I'm sorry, could you state your name and your position for the record? Thank you, Mr. Jones. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to provide before the Council of the District of Columbia and this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Okay, so I really appreciate um, the testimony, and I understand the the concerns um, that both have raised. And I want to start with you, Ms. Seminova, as there is no perfect analogy. Um, but as I think about some of your comments of the kind of needs that people have and the responsibility of the agency to build up infrastructure to kind of protect protect their service from being stolen, essentially. Um, for people ferrovating, I think about a grocery store and I think about the needs we have in our city to make sure that people have the resources they need to be fed. Um, and we also don't say it's the responsibility of the grocery store not to have any sort of citation if someone steals their products, but that they need to build up more infrastructure. And so I'm just trying to think about if what the corollary is, that why this service is different, that more needs to be done on an infrastructure level um, from the agency that we don't require in other contexts that also are associated with other serious needs that we have in the city. I think transportation is a fundamentally different need, and it is also a need that is directly funded um, by the district with the understanding that district residents, district students, um, district workers all need to move around. And it is, it's a fundamentally different um, public service than um, a store. So there is a deeper partnership between government and transportation than there is between um, a store and, and the district. So that that's one thing. And I think the other point there is that where I think this leads to the infrastructure question, and it is one that other jurisdictions are grappling with as well. I think New York is also looking at these raised fare gates, but it is something where Metro has taken on um, an, an infrastructure improvement to address this issue, and it has been incredibly successful. This infrastructure improvement, there's already a commitment as reported in Metro Transit um, press releases, there's already a commitment to extend these, um, these infrastructure improvements to all stations. And if you're seeing no tap percentages that are lower at these stations than there were prior to decriminalization of fare evasion in 2018, then there is, the, the council should, should see that that is a success for Metro in addressing this problem rather than addressing it through legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, and with the understanding that the Public Defender Service does not support this legislation as written, I want to get your sense on something that Councilmember Fruman raised about providing identification. We specifically did not include that requirement with the understanding that not everybody has a license on them um, and just asks for their name and address. But can you speak to um, what if you have any concerns about provide including a requirement for identification or a license? Um, many people will not have an identification and will not have a license with them when they travel. So for, for sure that is an issue. It's an issue for many young people don't have any identification at all. Many people don't carry identification. Um, and so that is certainly an issue in that. Um, and what we addressed in the testimony was the, the correct way to to sort of to limit the discretion of police officers is not to require everybody to carry identification at all times. That does not help with that problem. Um, rather, what we suggested if the council moves forward is to have a very fluid identification requirement and and real limitations on how long any period of detention can last. So like the street vending statute, which the council recently addressed. I think it's the most recently addressed um, sort of analogous provision. 
there's a, a provision within that statute that there should be no arrest, that no identification is required, um, and that the individual's obligation to provide a, a true name and, and um, address is the, the limitation there. So it, it's also expanding how an individual can provide it to limit the police discretion to sort of to, to state this isn't a correct name or this isn't a correct address. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Anzalo, can you walk us through practically, and of course there are a lot of different types of scenarios, but generally how, um, what the response looks like now if somebody fair evades and what the response would look like under this bill? Oh, certainly. So if fair, somebody fair evades into the system and police officers there, they can stop the person, tell them they have to leave and pay their fare. The person can walk away and, you know, they can either pay their fare or leave the station. Uh, if they don't and they refuse to leave the station, then the only redress we have is to arrest them for unlawful entry. That's what's currently happening now. If somebody's fare evading on the way out of a metro station or off of a bus, police officers have no authority to stop them on the way out. They can fare evade and walk out. We don't know who they are, what they're up to, or what they're doing. That's how it currently stands now. Under the current legislation, if somebody fair evades their way in, the police officer can stop them, ask them for their identification if they have it, or if they give a name. We can then run them through law enforcement database as well as Homeland Security databases to find out if they're wanted. They could be on a terrorist watch list. You know, there's various ways that we can try to identify them. If not, then their date of birth, the information that we require for identification, if they don't have any, and we'll write them the citation once we're satisfied, their $50 fine, and they're on their way. Under the current legislation, if they refuse to do that or they refuse to identify themselves, then at that time, they would be detained, arrested, taken to one of the police stations here in the District of Columbia, fingerprinted, and then released from that police station on a citation. Yes. Yeah. When I say failure to comply, the way Maryland and Virginia do it, that's you have to comply. When they say fail to comply with the citation process, you have to provide your true name. And identity. We basically check to see if, you know, if you had other paperwork, like uh, this young lady suggested, like, you know, other identification with your name on it, a bill or something like that. Or even when we run you through a database, that you may have had a driver's license at some point, you know, your address matches up with the name that's checked uh, and your date of birth matches up with the name that is checked. We can verify it through, you know, various means before we resort to somebody being arrested. That's correct. Right. Yes. It's a, it's a little diff more difficult on bus. Uh, usually when we do fare enforcement, there'll be officers on the bus at the time. Obviously we can't be on every bus or we'll do it at bus hub stations. So like Minnesota Avenue or, you know, let's say uh, Franconia Springfield uh, and the officer will be there as people board the bus and they don't pay their fare, then they would be cited and, uh, you know, sent on their way. Okay. Um what about the instance if somebody does not have a home address? We'd still verify it through their name, date of birth, social security number, who they were. Who and they were, and then how would the citation be issued? We'd put no fixed address and put their name, social security number, date of birth on the citation. Okay. Um, so this 97% statistic, um, just to re-clarify, not everybody who fair evades commits a violent crime in the system. Um, but you've testified that about 97% of people who have committed crimes in the system have fair evaded. Um, how do you go about gathering that type of information? So what we did is we looked at the crimes of murder, aggravated assault, uh, rape, uh, armed robbery, and uh, weapons offenses. So what we did is we took that from January 1 through September 20th. We went back and through video review where we had video 
and we found the perpetrator and the victim on video. Uh, and then we retrace, like we do in all our cases, try to retrace the perpetrator's entry and exit into the Metro system. Out of the cases we were able to, to do that, there are about 240 of them that were verified on video. The person who committed one of those crimes faravated into the Metro system. Okay. And it came to 97%. And you'll submit that information for the record for the yes. committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in terms of other issues that um, Ms. Seminova raised around discretion of the officers. So let's use an example of um, somebody gives their name or they hesitate a little bit in giving their name. Perhaps they're nervous. How is the balance going to be completed of ensuring that the person is providing accurate information, but that person is not being judged or profiled. Yeah, so we don't profile. We see the act happen, the person ferivates. So we see the act as ourselves. Uh, and then we, we're trained to ask for certain information that we can try to check and verify to write complete citation. So we do it in Maryland, Virginia. We used to do it here in DC until the law changed. This has been going on since uh, Metro started in 1976. So our officers are trained in this. Uh, they do it every day. Uh, and they have been for 47 years. Uh, and the vast majority of people, even prior to DC decriminalizing fair evasion, the vast majority of people that fair evader received citations, they weren't arrested. I don't think that was brought up here, but that is a fact. And are you able to pull that specific data? Because as, as we try to, and um, some of my colleagues were asking some of our public witnesses about how, what the estimates are for how much this will drive down fare evasion. And so if we can determine the distinction between who was given a citation in the past versus actually arrested, that would um, be helpful. How far back do you want to go? I mean, I think maybe the, the five years okay. before uh, the decriminalization. Okay, we can do that. So. How would this proposal fit into how the region handles fair evasion? It would bring it in line with what the region does. So in Virginia and Maryland, uh, fair evasion is criminal. You know, it's a, so it's a criminal citation. However, in Montgomery County, which is a little bit different and it's similar to what Montgomery County does, the act itself of fair evasion or public conduct ordinance crime, uh, like smoking or drinking, on Metro is a civil citation. So, but where it becomes, if the person doesn't cooperate with that civil citation in Montgomery County, then it becomes criminal and they can be arrested for failure to comply with the citation process. And why is that important to have some consistency within the way the region handles fair evasion? Well, I think it's important because, you know, we look at fair evasion, you know, as a regional wide issue. Uh, and with consistent enforcement and consistent penalties, then I think the public understands what's expected when you're riding Metro, that you'll be treated fairly, whether you're in Maryland, D.C., or Virginia. So I think having consistency uh, in law across the three jurisdictions is important. Do you have a sense or have heard anecdotally around people? awareness of the different rules in D.C. versus Virginia and Maryland? Yes. So when uh, fair evasion was decriminalized, uh, and then we had, this is anecdotally in my experience, and speaking with my officers and seeing and being out there uh, with them, once it was decriminalized in the district, uh, people thought it was decriminalized all over the region. So, and people would fair evade and they would say, well, hey, you know, it's decriminalized. Why are you citing me here in Bethesda? Or why are you citing me here in Vienna? So, well, it's still a crime here. You know, that's why we're citing you. Mm -hmm. So it did make a, it did have an impact on us. Yeah. Um, can you talk about your policy on enforcement for kids and kids ride free and how um, that has been going and, and will continue to go even if this legislation is passed? Yeah, so with uh, kids under the age of 18, you know, if they come into the system during school hours, you know, like 
one of the witnesses testified, you know, we want to get the kids safely to school. And this year with Kids Ride Free and Safe Passage, we've taken a different tack. We're trying to get the kids to go through one or two gates assigned. So that cuts down on a lot of, you know, what kids do, some disorderly behavior, like trying to impress people by jumping over the gates. So we try to funnel the kids through the one gate. If they don't have their ID, we just try to get, you know, they're, they're, they're tapping. If they don't have it, try to get the name of their school that they go to. And then once we compile the names of the schools, we don't ask the kids for their names. Ask, and then we go back to the schools and saying, hey, you know, 15 kids from this school didn't have their cards. What's the school doing to distribute the cards to the kids? You know, so and that's basically what we do. Now, if kids, if they're not in session and they are, kids do jump the gates. We stop the kids, tell them to stop. Uh, you know, now if the kid becomes, you know, it's an older kid and becomes, you know, resistive to the police and we call their parents to come pick them up over juvenile processing. They're not arrested. There's a 379 contact form that's filled out and the parents have to come pick up the kid. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Councilmember Parker, for a 15 minute round. Thank you, Chief Penzalo, I wanted to come back. It seemed like you were saying the transit police's authority currently is to be able to stop someone who is accused of fear evading and making them leave. And if they were, that's if they were coming into the system, if they were leaving the system, there isn't much of a recourse to go after them. So can you provide an explanation why this addition is necessary if the transit police already has an authority to hold folk accountable who are entering the system from fear evading? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. So uh, the only thing we can do is if you fare evade into the system, we can ask you to leave. And if you leave, you leave. Uh, so, you, yeah, you don't get the ride. There's no repercussions for doing it. You could go to another station. If there's a police officer not there, then you could fare, fare your way in. If you fare evade on your way out, there's nothing we can do for you. You're, again, stealing from, you know, Metro as you go out. But what it does, it limits our ability to make contact with individuals and, you know, check their names and statuses. Like we arrest probably this year so far, we've arrested almost 500 people on outstanding warrants just by doing these checks. The other thing it does too, we aren't able to detect people that could be on a Homeland Security terrorist watch list. So besides crime, you know, Metro is considered critical national infrastructure. And we do have a terrorism nexus that we do have to be on the lookout for. So if you go on your way out, you could be going into a community with open warrants, or you could be on a watch list, and there's no line of Metro being able to check to see who you are, that you may have an open warrant, or you may be on a, on a watch list. And I think that's dangerous for the communities. It's also a layer where we, as law enforcement, can provide certain layers. So let's say we arrest somebody on a DC warrant that's very evaded. And that means that person's taken out of the D.C. community and they go to court, you know, based on that open warrant. That means that they won't commit any more crimes. At least we've been able to take them out of the community and before the courts to let the courts decide what they want to do with them. So it goes to a crime reduction strategy as well. That that makes sense. And I'm sympathetic to some of those things. I want to just follow a train of thought. So earlier you said we can request an individual's name if they don't have an address we can search by their birth date and social security number how then do you prove that that social security number birth date or name is accurate well what we do is we search a database so if you give let's say you give mike Kenzello, i won't send my date of birth because i'm older than most people in here uh but you know my social security number so if i have an if i have a record search, and, and everybody knows this, if you go online, you can search open source records. And even in law enforcement database, if my name and social security number date of birth add up, either I'm a really good liar or, you know, I'm telling the truth. And there's things that you can look for in people to tell the truth. It's when their name, social security number don't match up, it comes back to another person or that, that person is deceased, the name that you gave then that's where you encounter that the person probably isn't providing you accurate information. Okay, so two questions here. 
you testified that less than 1% of citations for fair evasion have actually been paid. So how will issuing more citations solve this problem? And can you just clearly explain what in fact does happen if someone, let's say, is cited twice and they get two $100 fines, what happens if they fail to pay those fines? That's really a legislative fix that you would have to make with the Office of Administrative Hearings and the D.C. government, because currently they would be cited, they would have to pay the fine, and where they would have to pay the fine is the Office of Administrative Hearings. But to my knowledge, and like I said, I, I could be wrong, but the legislation doesn't address, like, what are the repercussions if the fines aren't paid? And so if passed as it's written today, would Metro be prepared to prevent someone from riding Metro should they be stopped and it is found that they have a litany of unpaid fines? We currently do not have a banning process in place of Metro. Okay. We heard earlier from a member of the WMATA board that Metro's goal is not to delay students on their way to school. Would Metro have any objection to limiting this bill to people who appear to be over the age of 22 or in fact over the age of 22? I don't think we would we would limit the bill to that, but I guess you would have to take a look at the juvenile statute and would fair evasion under Title 16 be considered delinquent behavior? And if it was considered to be delinquent behavior, which I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'd have to defer to the lawyers. But if that is delinquent behavior, then the police still have the opportunity to stop that, that juvenile, uh, question them, call their parent, or if they don't cooperate, you can still take them to juvenile processing where they can be diverted or called into question. So the legalities around it, you know, I'd have to leave that to you all and, and your lawyers. Okay, a couple of more questions. Uh, you mentioned that MTPD does not issue citations to individuals under 18. Prior to detaining someone, how would an officer assess whether or not an individual is under 18? Or would that come through the asking for their name, birth date, social security number if they did not pass the litmus test of the officer assuming they're over 18? Yeah, I mean, we there there would be occasion where we would have to try to identify the person through their name, what school they went to. Uh, you know, if they're claiming to be a juvenile, you know, we would have to have those questions asked of them and then try to verify who they were. And if we still can verify and they're claiming that they're a juvenile, then we would ask, OK, well, you know, we need your your parents phone number so we can call them to come pick you up. OK. Um, one last question just about logistics. So if I'm thinking of the typical metro station, let's say Fort Titan in Ward 5, could a an agent that is there at the gate ask someone for their name and therefore detain them? Or does it have to be an official of the transit police? In order to detain or stop anybody, it would have to be a police officer. It couldn't be uh, a Metro employee. Now, a Metro employee could issue the warning as an agent of the property for you to leave, but they can't make you leave. So that would have to be a police officer. So in order for this to even be applied, a member of the Metro police would need to be present. And then a, a similar question in terms of logistics, let's say there are two officers, let's say there is a crowd of 10 or more people, three of which are trying to jump the style. Um, it, it seems to me this would only work, there would be a capacity to the, the amount of people said officer would be able to detain. And so what other strategies would the police force be trying to employ to prevent fare evasion on the metro system? Well, particularly to the rail station, I think you've heard it so the general manager and Metro board, they've invested in these taller fare gates. And we have seen success with those because what would happen, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the old fare gates. I mean, basically you could step through the crack in the little uh, gates there. But with these, what is cutting down on, on people that would casually, what we call casually fare evade, just like, you know, walk through. You can't walk through these gates. You can't push through these gates. You have to be 
you know, fairly athletic to get up and over these gates and into the system. So I think by the, the infrastructure investment that Metro is making, I think that will cut down on some of this fare evasion. Now, coupled with that, the way we're employing, at least with the fare gates that are out there, what we try to do is have a number of officers at these fare gates. So the more officers that are at the fare gates, we've shown that one, people are more compliant and then, you know, uh, resistance and arrest actually uses the force go down because of the number of officers that are there. So that's another tactic because the last thing we want to do is arrest and the last thing we want to do is to use force. So we're trying to get people to comply with paying their fare and acting accordingly on Metro. So those are two of the strategies that we use uh, in reference to fare enforcement currently. Thank you. And I did note that incidents of violence on the Metro system have reportedly declined as has fare evasion. Do you have a specific number? or a data point, um, I can look it up, but just for the sake of this discussion. Yeah, I mean, our crime over last year is up, but what we've seen quarter to quarter is our crime is starting to decrease, uh, you know, on the Metro. And it's for a lot of reasons. I think, you know, there's no one, at least in my experience, you know, here in the district with the DC police and now with the Metro police, there's no one, one magic, thing that's going to decrease crime. It's actually a, a patchwork of a lot of things at play. And so community outreach, youth outreach, community education, working with schools, working with communities, enforcement, uh, working with the council and the legislative bodies on common sense legislation, and then working with our partners across the area. All that together is when you start to see a decrease in crime. It's not one thing that does it. Understood. Thank you, Ms. Simeonova, and I hope I got your name correct. I was struck by the comments you made about the challenges that returning citizens face using our transportation system. How can we more seamless, seamlessly ensure that these residents have access to our public transportation system? Um. I think it's it's not. Um, I think Metro Lift is a is a program that individuals could get once they have SNAP benefits. Um, so it's I'm I'm not sure exactly what um, the the sort of the scope of what is available through Morca. I think there are um, cards available at Morca. I don't know the length of time that individuals can have them. Metro Lift is a fifty percent program, so um, individuals would be entitled to pay a fifty percent fare once they can show. SNAP benefits. So perhaps what could be done is a fuller subsidy beyond 50% um, for, for individuals and for a prolonged period of time. Okay, that is helpful. I also really appreciate it you hearkening back to the lessons learned in the past um, from allowing these types of interactions between the public and namely our young people and transit police. And while I trust that transit police uh, are well-intentioned and wanting to do their jobs and everybody wants there to be safety and compliance on our metro system, data tells us that there are certain young people, namely Black young people, that continue to have negative run-ins uh, with police in general, but also transit police. Are there, you You mentioned some guardrails that we could look to, although you, you testified generally about not supporting the legislation, are there more expansive alterations we can make to ensure that young people are not adversely affected by this policy? That is not to say that we just want young people to be able to do what they want or to fear evade and or to conduct violence on the metro system, but how do we honor the commitment to keep metro safe while expanding guardrails to make sure we don't have a repeat of some of those incidents you shared in your testimony? So one thing would be limiting um, the action of stopping young people. So under age 22 or under age 25, limiting the authority of Metro Transit Police to stop young people. Another would be... Um, Can I jump in right there? So yes. a similar question that I asked the chief. Yes. How would I know that you're under 22 without stopping you and asking you for proof? I mean, for, for many individuals, that will be obvious. Um, and it, it is, you know, it's not a question that's asked in, in the juvenile curfew context. There's just 
there are some some youth who are particular who are young and that will be immediately obvious there will be youth that are sort of more in, in the in the gray line right closer to age 21 you couldn't tell if if somebody is 21 or 22 um so it does um it would protect some of the younger um younger residents from those interactions um it wouldn't prevent um MP, MTPD officers from from speaking to youth who are in the the sort of the higher range of whatever age range the council would set. Um, I heard the chief speak a lot about social security numbers, and while the the legislation, the proposed legislation, <clears throat> mentions only true name and address, but it seems like there's a lot of work being done by a social security number in this, and for individuals who do not have a social security number. Um, that presents a particular problem if that is the basis for which um, the police, if that is the basis of how uh, Metro Transit police officers are deciding that somebody has given their true identity. So um, the legislation could specify that social security number is not necessary, verification through social security number is not necessary, and that really what needs to happen is a name needs to be placed on paperwork, which could be done by somebody showing a homework assignment. It could be done by somebody showing mail. It could be done um, showing emails on their smartphone, um, rather than than limiting this to um, to social security numbers, which then would lead to arrest or taking into custody, fingerprinting, and detention, particularly for individuals who do not have um, a social security number. Which also seems counter to the district's position as a sanctuary city to have that particular. Um, kind of mechanism of enforcement that, that's so based on social security numbers. Thank you, that is my time. Thank you very much, Councilmember Parker. <clears throat> Let's go back to talking about practically what happens. So in the circumstance where an individual is not providing their true name or address, they are not complying with Metro Transit Police. Um, you mentioned, Chief, that the person could be detained. What, what will that look like? Yeah, so the interpretation of the current the pending legislation or the proposed legislation is detained would be the person would be arrested, taken to one of the police districts here in Washington, D.C., uh, one MPDs does because they do all of our processing for us. That person would then be photographed, fingerprinted to uh, identify who they are, and then they would be released from the station on a citation. And how long is that expected to take to determine the citation once you de determine who they are? Depends on, you know, a few hours. You know, it depends on how busy the district is that are processing people for arrest. Okay, a few hours. And so is it accurate to say nobody will be held overnight? Well, it, unless something comes back where they're wanted on a warrant or, or something like that, then they'd have to be presented in court the next day. Right, of course. But nobody is going to be held overnight for the sole violation of fair evasion. No, not the mind knowledge. Okay, thank you. I think that's important as we heard from a number of witnesses about these long incarceration dates, and that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, I can tell you in my experience, I was a police officer here in the District of Columbia for almost 30 years, and I've been here at Metro for about five and a half years. I've never heard of somebody being held in detention for fair evasion or a uh, criminal citation here in the District of Columbia uh, overnight or for six months. I've never heard of that. Okay, thank you very much. And Chief, if I can ask you just to lean in a little bit oh, to the microphone. Sorry. Yep, I'm sorry. Oh, hard to hear. I know, I, I need reminding for it as well. Thank you. Um, so. Ms. Seminova, one of our public witnesses, Tracy Lowe, talked about earlier um, that this bill is really making consistent for Metro what we have for pedestrian citation. I'm not sure if you were able to hear that testimony or if you have a response to that. I, I was able to hear that testimony. So in, in the there is a pedestrian section um, that's in Title 50. I don't believe that it has been updated. I was looking at it at it briefly during that testimony. Um, I don't believe that it has been updated, certainly not updated as recently as the street vending um, provisions have been updated, but it's, it is similar. It appears that the language is similar to what is being proposed, um, the requirement of a true name and 
um, address for the purposes of including that information on a civil infraction. Um, and it includes that same language about not requiring to possess or display um, proof of identity. I do think that much more analogous is the more modern take, which the council has just looked at, which is street vending, which provides that there shall not be an arrest and that the detention should be only for the length of period of time necessary to issue the civil infraction. Because if that's the council's goal, then that detention should be only for that period of time. And it shouldn't be um, leading to photographing, fingerprinting, and all of those, all of that MPD contact has now much more greater likelihood of creating collateral consequences for the individual. And if the entire purpose of the interaction between Metro Transit Police and the individual is to issue the citation, then Metro Transit Police should, at the station without transporting the individual, um, give them every single opportunity to show any form of indicia of identity uh, in order to avoid that process of verifying social security numbers, getting fingerprints done, all for a civil infraction. There's no other civil infraction, for instance, parking meters that require fingerprinting and photograph all to all for the, the purpose of, um, of payment of that civil infraction. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much. I'm going to ask the chief to respond to that in a moment, but I, I just want to ask you about this because and I just want to get a little help with the echo. One moment. All right, let me try this. Okay. Um, one of the issues that has come to us over the last several months is that Metro Transit Police in Momata, I think there's a way we can turn down the volume maybe, okay, um, has said that is the desire. The desire is to have somebody right there issue the civil citation, but that in practice, there are so many examples where someone will say, we're not engaging with you. We don't have to. And they'll walk away or they'll give a false name or they'll be otherwise disrespectful or, or harmful to the uh, Metro Transit Police. And so what, what would you propose doing in those circumstances that are not the vast majority of the cases, hopefully, um, but that are still a very real problem if we have a civil enforcement tool that is unable to be enforced? Your mic. I don't think we ha we have a civil enforcement tool that's unable to be enforced. I think part of what Chief Enzolo stated was that if multiple officers are present, that that reduces um, levels of conflict. Um, and so, if you have multiple officers present and they ask for some indicia of identification, and then the 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 name is issued, the, the name is placed on a citation, and the citation is given. Um, I think that really, though, the focus in this system. Um, has, has been avoiding fair evasion through the infrastructure improvements. And the infrastructure improvements have, this is in, I, I believe in, in Metro Transit's um, press release, it's, it's that it's down to 2% no-tap percentages, which are lower than the no-tap percentages during criminal enforcement. And so balancing the harms that are caused by the interactions between police and residents over this fair and the ability to so essentially solve the problem through infrastructure, that that's where the council should be leaning and be giving time to resolve um, the question of fair evasion through this, these physical um, barriers that are, that are much, that, that are more effective than prior criminalization of fair evasion even. Even if WMATA was able to build up these fair gates at every station and overnight, and I think the time sensitivity here is actually very important to address as we seek to improve public safety throughout our city in every avenue of, of transportation and corridor that this is really important to act urgently on. Um, even if that was able to be done overnight, in the case where somebody did find their way over the fair gate, and did not comply with transit police, 
what would you propose be the next step if they just were flagrantly not complying with transit police? Um, in terms of what to do about that individual? Right, because yeah. that, that's what we're trying to solve for really is we have we, the city decriminalized fare evasion. Um, it's still a civil fine under this legislation. It is just intending to add teeth to what that civil fine means because we still have people who will say, we're not going to engage with you or we're not going to give you a real name or we don't have to. Um, and so that civil fine essentially means nothing without those teeth. And so my question to you is, is there another way to give the civil fine teeth? I don't know that like te that teeth needs to be the approach as um, the, the sort of the, the framework that you're, you're like, what does give gives the, the civil fine teeth? Can we get to the root causes of the issue? Can, um, can WMATA diminish the percentage of fare evasion to a very low, very, very low percentage through infrastructure improvements? Can the remaining um, percentages that remain be addressed through grants, subsidies, looking at what the issues are, and then looking at what um, remains in terms of interaction between Metro Transit Police and individuals who are stopped for fare evasion? How often is that leading to a citation? How often is that being paid? How, how frequently are these interactions happening? So I think this traditional approach of there needs to be criminalization to solve this problem is not the, the answer here. And that it's our, one, it's already being solved otherwise. There are programs being put into place that are trying to make Metro more affordable. It is investing in those programs, investing in the infrastructure improvements. And then that should resolve the significant um, proportion of of the concern, more, the overwhelming sort of concerns of WMATA and the council. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, and that's balanced on the other side of the things that we saw in the 2018 um, report that were reported in the media of individuals being um, pepper sprayed and needing students being pepper sprayed and needing resuscitation of individuals being held down. That is all balanced on the other side of this revenue um, need. So I think that's the question really is why, why, would, why would the council inflict so much harm again, knowing what that harm entailed before, knowing how it was disproportionately impacting young people, black residents, knowing all of that why is that the same? Why are we reverting to a solution that failed, that was a non-solution yeah. instead of moving forward with different measures? I would just clarify, this is not reverting because it is still a civil enforcement. It is just making civil enforcement mean something. Um, but Chief, I want to ask you to respond to some of these instances that Ms. Seminova talked about just now and, and in her testimony about pepper spray, people being held down. If you have a response to are there those specific instances that she mentioned or, or what you're doing to build a culture and environment um, that is that is safe and civil? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, so our officers go through 39 weeks of recruit training uh, and they do in-service training every year. And we have to comply with Maryland, D.C. and Virginia compliance. Uh, and the other thing is, too, once the officers re complete the 39 weeks of recruit training, then they have an additional 10 weeks with a field training officer. So from the time, I know this is a long-winded answer, but I just want to give you some context there. So from the time we hire a Metro Transit police officer until the time that they're fully trained, it's almost a year. Most police departments, their training is about six months. Ours is almost a year. We police based on people's uh, actions. If they commit a criminal activity, then we use the minimum amount of force necessary to stop that situation and bring that person under control. That's the standard across the country. Uh, unfortunately, not all arrests go like you know a lot of people want to see it go. Unfortunately, sometimes arrests they can be ugly to watch, you know, because people resist and then the officers have to act on that resistance. I can't reference her specific cases. But that's been my experience of being a police officer for over 30 years. So it's really up to people's behavior and how they interact with the police once they are detained and taken into custody. 
Sometimes force is used and it's ugly. Uh, there's no question about that, but it's based on, at least in my experience, the individual is resistant to that force that's being taken into custody. And sometimes that does involve pepper spray or you know, other uh, types of non-lethal weapons to bring that person into compliance or just physical force itself. So, or I mean, just what? Physical force itself. So we've talked a little bit about kids and the different kind of protocols and response um, for kids versus adults. Are those policies in writing within Metro Transit Police? They are. We have a order on juveniles, how we handle juveniles. Okay, and that is part of the training? It is. Okay, could you submit that for the committee as well? Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So there's been a lot of concern expressed about racial inequity in how fare evasion is enforced. And I've seen some comments suggesting that and MTPD has focused on stations and locations with more black residents um, and ignoring stations with more white residents, even if rates of fare evasion are equivalent. Can you respond to that allegation? Yeah, I'd say it's not true. So what we do is we look at crime numbers, complaints, and you know we also factor in fare evasion where it's happened. We have actually really good data now, and we do a force it across, you know, from Pentagon City. Uh, to uh, Bethesda, to Shady Grove, to New Carrollton, to Gallery Place, to Anacostia, to Franconia, Springfield, uh, you know, now into Loudoun County. So we enforce, you know, fare evasion, you know, across the, the region, you know, and, you know, we do it based on what we observe. If we observe somebody and the act of, you know, evading the fare, then that person, regardless of their, you know, what people look at as race, that person has committed a crime regardless of the race, and then we take the appropriate enforcement action. Thank you. Um, so you spoke about, or we have talked today about uh, infrastructure at some of the stations that have been demonstrably effective at reducing fare evasion. Um, I know this is more appropriately a question for WMATA, but what is your sense on the viability of expanding those infrastructure investments throughout the system? A little bit beyond my scope and metro, but my personal opinion is I think that's the right road to go down. I think at least in the metro rail stations, bus is a little bit different, but these gates I do believe will stop what we call people that are casual fare evaders, people that could just easily walk through the system and it got worse particularly with the decriminalization. I think people saw that, hey, you know, I'm not paying my, these people aren't paying fare, so why would I pay a fare? And they would walk through, you know. Uh, with these gates, you can't do that. You, you can't, you physically, you would have to be pretty athletic or very determined to get over this gate and into the metro. And I, I think, like I said before, it's not one thing that I think will will solve the crime issue on Metro. It's it's many things taken together, fair enforcement being one, the higher fare gates being another. If I could get more police officers hired because I'm short right now, that will also, you know, gravitate towards that multitude uh, of things that we want to do in order to prevent and keep people safe on Metro or that they're free from crime and harassment. Thank you for that. And can I Go respond ahead. to that? Sure. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that WMATA has released a press release saying that those gates will be system-wide um, within a year of deployment and that they were deployed in summer of 23, um, partially. Um, second, as to the question of that not reverting, while it remains a civil infraction, the idea that you can arrest, take transport, um, fingerprint, photograph, keep at the station for several hours, that those are the entire trappings of, of a criminal uh, of criminal infraction, of a criminal encounter with um, Metropolitan Police Department. So it's not while it became while there is a civil fine, the discretion to then funnel through the system of detention, of being in handcuffs, going through, being searched, all of those things, it can be a financial penalty at the end of the, of the line, but all of those things are severe criminal consequences that we think about when we think about what is a criminal um, 
criminal offense. So it's all of those same harms that the council was trying to avoid. And what I heard Chief Gonzalo say about sometimes it involves physical force, sometimes it involves pepper spray. Um, those are all the harms that the council decided were not worth subjecting individuals to, even individuals who had committed the, the wrongdoing act of fair evasion, the, uh, that it wasn't worth the possibility of subjecting individuals to that for, on the other hand, the loss of revenue, particularly here that where now the loss of revenue is being controlled through other measures. And so, but even when the council wasn't, didn't have a, a forecast of controlling the loss of revenue in another way, the council decided that that its values, that the district values meant that the district did not want to subject individuals to physical force and pepper spray on as the other, as the flip side of um, or fingerprinting and photographing and transport in handcuffs to a police station as the flip side of the consequence of um, fair evasion. Right. And I think that that is important and that's not exactly the conversation that this bill is addressing. This bill isn't really a matter of revenue support or criminalization. Um, this bill is still supporting the idea of civil enforcement but with a ramp up, if civil enforcement is not complied with. And so um, those consequences of interactions with the justice system, we want to continue avoiding as much as we can. And if there is continued disobedience, dis not following the law, um, I don't know another way to not have the civil enforcement mean something. I think it's telling that what Chief Anzalo said is that previously, pr prior to decriminalization, uh, Metro Transit Police always had the option to give a citation. And the citation option was frequently used, was used the majority of the time. But it was in interactions that became well publicized and well known that where Metro Transit decided not to use the civil mechanisms, perhaps because somebody didn't give a name, that led to all of these drastic consequences. So it is returning to a system where um, these interactions can lead to drastic consequences for individuals, the same as it did prior to 2018. So where where there is con where there is some sort of conflict in the um, in the issuing of an infraction notice, which was I, th I think. Um, the chief was saying was the primary mechanism that was used prior to decriminalization. And so it will return the district to that position. Um, chief, can you talk about the Metro Transit Police's efforts to engage with community, with the community and build relationships with the communities that you're serving and policing? Oh, well, certainly. So uh, with our community services bureau, well, there's a couple of things. So we, we did with, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, we did hire a crisis intervention specialist. So we, we've noticed that there are a large amount of uh, individuals that are using uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, uh, as well as being homeless uh, that are around our stations and on our buses. So instead of a police response, we've hired crisis intervention specialists. We've only got four right now that are fully trained. We're trying to get six more on board but they'll go out in the community, they'll work with uh, different non-governmental organizations as well as government organizations to try to connect these individuals with services, to try to get them either substance abuse treatment or you know, housing vouchers or you know, any social services that they may need. And all, all the individuals are receptive you know, mm -hmm. to the outreach, but at least what we're trying to do is put them in contact with you know, the appropriate agencies where they could possibly get help. The other thing with our Community Services Bureau, uh, we do a lot of outreach with the schools. Uh, we have a youth advisory council uh, that meets every month. And basically with that, they interact with police officers and our civilian personnel, as well as WMATA uh, employees on college opportunities, mentoring, we bring in guest speakers. Uh, we try to follow them through you know, with their homes, you know, if they're having certain issues with school or their home life, we, you know, we try to be there to support them. And we also teach them about, you know, the, uh, the dangers of the metro system. You know, horseplay in the metro system, it's a very unforgiving environment. 
you know, it's all concrete, it's steel track, and there's an electric current that runs through that that will kill you if you get too close to that third rail. The other thing is too, buses and trains, they can't stop on a dime. So if you're horse playing around a bus or you run into the street, that bus cannot make an immediate stop and that bus will, you know, cause a lot of damage if not kill you. Same with a rail car. You know, if you think you can get on and train surf, unfortunately, we've had a couple of individuals that have tried that and ended up dying as a result of that. Uh, and we've had individuals thinking that they could beat the train, they could run on the tracks and then get up and that train hits them and kills them. So there are a lot of dangers that we try to engage with the youth about, let them know that if you utilize Metro as a means of transportation and you respect the environment and the people that ride Metro, it's a great system, and that's what we try to instill with them. Uh, and then we do a lot of community outreach. We do at least two outreach events a week at the various uh, metro stations throughout the Maryland, D.C. region. Uh, we also uh, participate in the Office of Attorney General's Restorative Justice Program, and we also do community events uh, like we'll feed the homeless at Thanksgiving at Union Station. Uh, we'll have events at you know uh, different metro stations around the area. We just did our first backpack giveaway at the Fort Totten Metro. We had over 1,500 families and people respond so we could give them school supplies to start the year off and then educate them about the metro system, you know, what we do. So I think that's where we put a lot of investment on that side because what we're trying to do is build trusting relationships with the community. Uh, you know, and get their help. You know, we need the community help as far as crime goes. We have the 30,000 cameras on the metro system. Our officers are equipped with body-worn cameras, but we also need people to come forward and point out criminal behavior or suspicious behavior to us so then we can then act and investigate and make sure that everybody's safe. Thank you. Mr. John, is it Jones? Oh, yes. Um, can you just speak for a little bit about the bus system and if any ways the fare evasion challenges are distinct from rail in other ways that we've talked about? I know you talked about a little bit about uh, our inability to have Metro Transit police on every bus. And so what would this look like in practice? And what are some of the challenges you're seeing in the bus system? Uh, it's very challenging, as Chief said. But first, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come before the committee and thank you for your leadership on pushing this legislation forward. Um, from a bus perspective, it's extremely challenging because like a rail station, a bus is not fixed, right? So as Chief mentioned earlier, he just doesn't have the resources to put on every single bus throughout every route at every bus stop. So just wanted to provide that context. Um, so what we do at this point, we partner with Chief, provide him with information that we get from our team about problematic areas where we have with fair evasion if it's happening somewhere in between the lines. Um, we know about some of our hotspots and some of our more challenging areas. Uh, but it's drastically different, different from the rail. Um, with the rail, you have infrastructure such as fare gates. We don't have that infrastructure on a bus. Uh, customers in the rail, they pay at a fare gate. On the bus, they pay at a fare box. Big difference and much more challenging to manage. And how are bus operators trained to, to deal with this? Um, I've seen myself many times yeah. where somebody walks in and um, you know, there's some shrugging and, and that, that's kind of it. So our bus oper operators are trained not to engage customers when they don't pay their fare. Okay. We changed that about five, approximately five years ago. Uh, what they do is they uh, press the eight key on the fare box to denote that someone entered the bus without paying. Okay. Um, and from a bus operator perspective, and I would even go off and say from a station manager perspective, um, while they're trained not to engage, it is uh, very challenging when a person comes to work, you have a high sense of pride, um, and they really want to do the right thing. Uh, every time I have the opportunity to talk to bus operators, uh, there are two, two things that come up, uh, personal safety and fare evasion. And to see people fare evade, walk past the fare box, walk past or jump over the uh, fare gates, it does have a negative impact on our team members. The team feels like they're being disrespected. While that may not necessarily be the intent of the ferry evaders, but our bus operators, our station managers are human as well. And the ferry evaders, quite frankly, just disregard the existence of our hardworking men and women that are coming to work every day to provide the best service they can and an important service for this region. 
So, you know, I just wanted to offer this perspective for the, uh, for the committee. If someone came in your office every day, multiple people come in your office every day and steal something, how would you feel? The bus, the, the, the station, that's the bus operators in the station manager's office. Well, thank you so much um, for sharing that. And I think it's a really important perspective um, as we think about the many, many um, voices and experiences in the city that need to be taken into account in these challenges. And the perception of disorder and lawlessness is very important. Um, and as the chief talked about, the, I appreciated your comments about the patchwork of impacts, just like a lot of challenges led us here into the city of having the rates of disorder, of crime, of violence that we're experiencing. A lot of different interventions are going to be needed to get us out of it. Um, this tool is not going to solve all challenges in the system, um, but I do believe it's important that our laws mean something um, in the city. And until we have a free transit system um, and we have a, a system where people have to pay fares, that, that has to mean something. Um, I do want to just ask you, Chief, and we're going to close out in a moment. Um, there was a conversation about data and transparency, and Ms. Seminova, you're welcome to um, uh, share your thoughts on this as well, that uh, one of my colleagues, Councilmember Fruman, mentioned of if we could use a similar model to determine how many stops are being made, who is it getting an, a civil fine, who is um, being escalated and, and getting the higher fine. Um, is that something that you think your infrastructure would enable you to do and to provide to the council? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about is if this bill passes, then we would have to build that, you know, a little bit. of it. We track it currently, and that's something, I mean, I don't think I personally don't have a problem with providing data that's transparent, you know, but obviously, you know, I don't run Metro, so I would have to ask my bosses, you know, if they're okay with that. But I think they would be, to be honest with you. Yeah. One point, though, and you know, one of my deputies did give it to me. So, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut into your time. But so for the, yeah. the, the fair enforcement that we've done in 2023 this year, and this is across the region, you know, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, we've issued over 3,400 citations currently only 9% of those have resulted in arrests. That's so, in Maryland? Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Can you say those numbers when we're talking 3,400 citations? Right. Since uh, November of 2022 to current year, uh, a little over 3,400. And out of those, only 9% have resulted in arrests. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That. Seminova, do you have any thoughts on this um, data and transparency idea if this legislation does move forward um, to kind of continue oversight and how these citations are being given and, and if additional tweaks are needed? I think it would make sense to include a data provision if this legislation moves forward. Um, again, I think that the bigger issue is really limiting the amount of detention and the amount of interaction if, if this legislation moves forward, I think that is the more the most important piece is, is mirroring that no arrest should take place, that individuals should not be leaving um, stations with transit officers. They should instead be identified there for the purposes of giving them the civil infraction there at the station. And that 9% of 3,400 is very many individuals who are subject to arrest, detention, um, over, over a fare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do either of you have any other closing thoughts that you'd like to share? No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief. No, thank you for allowing us to come and testify. And I, I definitely support this bill. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate yeah, you both, you all being here um, today and the work that all of you do. I think these perspectives are really important um, as we continue to try to craft solutions that are appropriately addressing the, the very real challenges that we're facing in the city and on the system right now. 
um, and do so in a manner that's going to take into account lessons learned from the past and, and do so fairly and justly. Um, and so conversations will, will definitely continue about how to move that forward. As I said before, I, I do believe that we are a city of laws and those laws have to be followed. Um, if they're not gonna be followed, we shouldn't have them on the books. And I think that that's an important, um, not only message to send, but way to, to operate um, in our day-to-day -day because residents throughout the city deserve to be safe. They deserve to feel and be safe while they're using our transit system. Um, and, and our law enforcement partners need to have the tools as well to, to be participants in, in keeping the system safe. And so that is something I'm going to continue to work on. Um, I want to thank everybody again for their testimony and those public witnesses who joined us today. Um, if you weren't able to submit testimony, you can still submit your testimony by email through October 25th. Uh, you can email that to judiciary at dccouncil.gov. With that, the time is now 12.52 p.m. on October 11th, the same day we began.